Hey y'all, welcome back. Yay! Uh, welcome for the first time <laughs> to Gadfly, the podcast about third parties, French candidates, and just generally weird American election history. Mm, love uh, it. <laughs> I'm Dusty Wilson. I'm Una O'Leary. And today, um, uh, we're going to start with a little bit of Rocky news. <gasps> uh, I don't know, I gotta get a good Foley noise for that. But yeah, so Rocky De La Fuente, topic of the very first episode of this podcast. Highly recommend you go back and listen. The, mm-hmm. man's a, the man's a gem. But the newest news of Rocky, Rocky has dropped out of the Republican race in eight states. Of the so, so he's only running in 11 states now? Yeah, yeah, he's only on 11 ballots as of right now. But the reasoning behind that, as posited by one of my favorite political Twitters, politics1.com, his theory is that Rocky's doing this because all eight of those states have something called sore loser laws. Where if you lose a primary for the Democrats or the Republicans, you cannot just turn around and run a third party campaign. Oh, but if you if you preemptively drop out, then mm-hmm. you Oh wow. So I think this Rocky is Rocky loves him some loopholes. Yeah. I think this is a sign that Rocky might be resurrecting the American Delta Party. What can only hope? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Who genuinely knows? Um, and also a, a nice side thing. So the um, a number of states have decided that they're not going to hold Republican primaries this year. Mm. And that's, I mean, that's actually kind of common if you have an incumbent president and no one's really challenging him. That happened a lot when uh, Barack Obama was running for re-election. But it's a little weird this time around when there's actually some major candidates running against Trump, yeah. despite the fact that they're not really polling very well. Yeah. So about eight or nine states have decided, nah, Trump's the only guy on the ballot. And in the state of Minnesota, Rocky De La Fuente has uh, sued the state, uh, saying that it is, I don't know if it's unconstitutional or against the law, but he is suing the state of Minnesota to try to get on the ballot. I don't know if he's still doing that now that he's dropped out of some races, but... Oh, man. I, oh. (laughs) Coming from the other side, I'm just like, yeah, let them fight. Yeah. (laughs) Eat yourselves. I love the, the Godzilla theory of politics. Yes. <laughs> I got some, some solid advice that maybe when we start these episodes, I should talk about why we're talking about these people and why, you know, why it matters. <laughs> that's, that's such sage wisdom. It really is. You yeah, know? I, I mean, you got, you got to hook them in instead of just talking, you know, blindly about something. Yeah, and then finding yourself suddenly talking about David Duke. Yeah, sorry, not sorry. <laughs> That uh, everyone needed to. That's that's a life lesson. So yeah, so today we're going to be talking about not just a person, but an entire political party. Mm. And the reason we're talking about them is because it was a party that has essentially existed in spirit since this state began. So we're going to be talking about the Alaskan Independence Party. To learn a bit about it, we gotta learn about the history of Alaska, something we don't really do a lot here in America. No. Because, I mean, as American textbooks go, or at least in my experience, when you learn about American history, you start at the French and Indian War, you rush over that, you get to uh, the Revolutionary War. Spend a lot of time there. Tons. Tons of time. You kind of learn about Madison and Monroe, but then you get right to that Civil War. Yeah. Uh, and then, once the Civil War's done, it's usually May, and you don't really have much time <laughs> else for the rest of American history. <laughs> if, yeah. Depending on the public school that you went to yeah. and whether or not your incredibly erudite and wonderful government and civ teacher is on maternity leave and you've been left with a substitute teacher who just puts in a VHS of President of Dave, that, that movie from the 90s, oh, no. you may or may not get through World War II. Oh you don't God. know. You don't know. Yeah. I mean... To be fair, I had really amazing teachers, and I think their problem was more they just wanted to teach us so much about this stuff yeah. that by the time it got to May, the final hundred pages of any history textbooks we got were just a mystery. Yeah, it's right. Just, there's a picture of Reagan, and that's the last time they updated this book. Exa- yes, that's the other thing. Again, your mileage may vary depending on the public school that you went to. <laughs> Whether or not the maps still contain an East and West Germany. <laughs> yes. As a product of public schools, I love them. I am pro public school. Yeah. But, you know, and I went to one that was in the shadow of a large public university. So a lot of professor brats, like, like we were well taken care of. And still, still, yeah. you were lucky to make it to Gorbachev tear down this wall. <laughs> So yeah, we're going to talk about 
how Alaska came to be because there's a bit of myth about it, but also after that myth, we really don't know a whole lot about it here in America. We don't. Ooh, and I will also make an unsponsored pitch to pick up this book that maybe came out last year called How to Hide an Empire. As yes! Oh, yeah, I was waiting yeah, to get that book yeah. so bad. Uh, I, I read everything except the last two chapters. <laughs> We never finished books. This is it. This is totally it. Uh, because I had to drop it back to the library. But it is so good. And it definitely talks about Alaska. And it's and so this will this will be a fun test for me to see how much knowledge I retain oh, yeah. from reading that. <laughs> First off, we got to start with the failed history of Russian America. Mm. Uh, so in 1774, the Russians made their first settlement in Unalaska on Amaknak Island. Amaknak is part of the long-stretching Aleutian Islands, named after the indigenous Aleut people who had lived there for a very, very long time. The Russians opened a permanent fur trading post and began their expanse into a new vast tract of glaciers and snow. By 1844, Russia established 17 settlements, missions, and forts throughout Alaska, as well as a pair of forts in Hawaii and Fort Ross in Sonoma County, California. All in all, Fairly modest empire in the New World, doing pretty good. The biggest problem, though, was convincing Russians to move from a cold place they were familiar with to a cold place they knew nothing about. Yeah. It's a, a big-ass country, y'all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they really should have made the push for Sonoma. I think that would have gotten a lot more people to, <laughs> to take over California. Yeah. It's like, what about Odessa? It's like, just wait till 2016. <laughs> <laughs> By 1856, though, things were uh, not doing really good for the Russian Empire. They just lost the Crimean War against the Ottoman Empire, the French and the British Empires, and Ale Emperor Alexander II was beginning to realize Alaska may be more trouble than it's worth. Especially so when they're... Away. Yeah, so far away, a new war was probably about to start, and it just wasn't worth the time. Alaska wasn't very easy to defend, especially with British Canada right next door. Mm. But they had also been over hunting, so the fur trade was not doing very well either. God damn it. Uh, so without having a flourishing industry as justification for staying there, Russia put Alaska on the market. So Emperor Alexander II wouldn't find a seller until after the American Civil War, when U.S. Secretary of State William Seward made an offer of two cents for every acre of land, which today we, it would be about 34 cents an acre. Mm, such a bargain. It's a great deal. On March 30th, 1867, the Russians agreed, and Alaska was all America's for a grand total of $7.2 million. And the Russian Empire in Alaska was renamed the Department of Alaska, and the state was run by the U.S. Army for about 10 years. The Treasury Department took a swing at running it for two years, then passed it off to the Navy for another five, uh, before the state was renamed again as the District of Alaska. During this time... Uh, Alaska would get its first real burst in population when someone discovered gold and people lost their shit. Yeah. Uh, the Klondike Gold Rush would bring about 100,000 people to Alaska, leaving a whole mess of towns and new industries in their wake. In the end, only about 30,000 people would end up making it to Canada where the gold actually was. That didn't stop people from setting up shop in Alaska and trying their luck. It should also be noted that the gold rush resulted in the native Han people being forced from their land to a reservation to make way for a lot of greedy people, oh. resulting in a subsequent genocide that resulted in there only being about 300 Han people remaining today. Oh. Don't hear a lot about that. Nope. But it's this independent spirit, quote-unquote, <laughs> that created the emotional culture that has so strongly embedded itself in Alaskan identity. Even after the gold rush ended, people had grown to like the idea that if no one claimed a land, then you could just take it. You could hunt and fish wherever you wanted. You could build a home however you wanted. Just make a life all your own without anyone telling you otherwise. Alaska would get another name change in 1912 to the Territory of Alaska. The future state would then get its second major boost towards statehood during World War II. The state was a great geographic advantage for America, and it would actually lead to the Japanese invasion of the Aleutian Islands. Uh, lasting from June 3rd, 1942 to August 15th, 1943, the Aleutian Islands campaign would result in the deaths of 6,000 people on both sides, and Japan would capture the only bits of American land in the entire war. This was the first time America had been successfully invaded since the War of 1812. After the war, it became all the more apparent that Alaska would become a battleground for any future war, especially one of the colder sorts. In 1946, Alaskans would be given a non-binding referendum on statehood, where statehood was favored 3 to 1. Congress would even, wouldn't even consider a vote on it. <laughs> the more things change, the more they stay the same. Mm -hmm. So there was a stalemate that lasted until about 1958. Man. When President Dwight D. Eisenhower endorsed a bill for Alaskan statehood. Opponents of the bill mostly stepped aside, and the Alaskan Statehood Act passed 64 to 20. 
The final vote on the matter was given to the Alaskans, and by a 6-1 to one margin, they overwhelmingly chose statehood. And on January 3rd, 1959, President Eisenhower made Alaska the 49th state in the Union. With a landslide vote like that, you might assume that the people who voted against statehood would just, you know, grudgingly accept that they didn't have the people to win and would just accept, yeah, we're going to be a state now. And besides, it's much harder to secede from the United States than it is to become part of it. Yeah, so hard. Just, just get in. That's a quitter's attitude. No. And that sure as hell was never the attitude of a man by the name of Joe Vogler. Born in 1913 in Barnes, Kansas, Joe grew up on his family farm. He graduated from high school at the age of 16, and at 21 would graduate from the University of Kansas with a degree in law. Now, when you listen to Joe Vogler speak, you either hear one of two things. One is a more modern take on the old-timey prospector trope, and the other is a cranky old fuck. <laughs> Joe Vogler's both. <laughs> now, Wikipedia states that Vogler burned all of his professional bridges in Kansas due to his vocal dislike of President Franklin D. Roosevelt. And while, yeah, in the middle of World War II, probably not the best time to be anti-FDR, but looking at some of the the voting at the time in Kansas, that, that argument really doesn't make sense. The, the state had gone to FDR in 1932 and 36, but by 1940, the state had swayed its support to FDR's challenger, uh, Wendell Wilkie, and had voted him, uh, voted for Wilkie by uh, 57% in 1940, and then Thomas E. Dewey by 60% in 1944. Hmm. So it's probably safe to say that Vogler had said far more than just some random shitty things about FDR and pissed off enough people that he really couldn't continue a law career in the state. Oh, guys, <laughs> just run out. Yeah. And so in 1942, he picked up his stuff and he moved to Alaska. He no longer continued his career in law and decided to take a civilian job at Ladfield with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and became an, a lifelong residency in Fairbanks. But as the old saying goes, you can take Joe out of Kansas, but you can't take the bitchy old crank out of Joe. In 1948, Joe had found an enemy in Paul and Flora Greenman. The Greenmans operated University Bus Lines, a company that mostly drove students from Fairbanks to the University of Alaska in Anchorage. And they had the audacity to use the one bridge out of town. The one bridge out of Fairbanks that would get you to Anchorage uh, was the Cushman Street Bridge. And it was incredibly narrow. It was about eight feet wide and was far too thin to accommodate a car going one way and the bus going the other. Ah. So whenever the bus had to leave town, it had to use the whole bridge. And everyone else would have to yield until it passed. And for Joe Hobler, this 400 feet was a bridge too far. Oh, God. You're welcome. Get out. <laughs> Podcast done. <laughs> so Vogler hired former state representative and future state house speaker of Alaska, Warren A. Taylor, to be his lawyer. And so began Vogler versus Greenman, or as it was more commonly known, the Battle of the Bridge. And just, I'm sure you're coming to this as well, but this is a state that most recently became known for, like, Bridge to Nowhere in yeah. the 90s. So, yeah, long, a lot of bridge history <laughs> in Alaska. This is their thing. Yeah. Now, as I've said before, there's not that much in this world that I find more satisfying and hilarious than legal shade. <laughs> so District Judge Pratt, I really wish I could find his first name, wrote a 2,000 word finding in which he essentially said to Joe, there are 13 cases that set precedents that if there is a bridge and it's barely bigger than a bus, it is legally dangerous to make that bus share a bridge with your dumb car. So no, you lose. Just wait five minutes. Fuck that bus. <laughs> I'm not waiting five minutes. Fuck that bus. God, it's bringing students to college. Yeah. Uh, the Greenlands would be allowed to continue using the bridge. Uh, Joe won the right to be even more pissed off about it. <laughs> that is that is the heart, I feel, of so many of these parties. Oh, yeah. It's like the right to victimhood. Yes. Like... Pissy, pissy victimhood. <laughs> In 1951, Joe would begin his second favorite career, prospecting. Yes. Vogler gained 80 acres on Homestake Creek near Fairbanks before eventually expanding his claim to a full 400 acres. So to understand a bit more of Joe's future anger and the attitude of other Alaskans who would eventually agree with him, it's kind of helpful to understand what the hell a homestead is. Yeah. Unlike other places in America where you buy land from the previous owner, a homestead is land that is either previously owned by the government or is kind of in a state of public domain that ignores any indigenous rights. Which I'm sure also applies to the first the, like government ownership. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the uh, Homestead Act of 1862 dictated that much of this land would be free to anyone who placed a claim and cultivated the land. The land wasn't expanded to Alaska until 1898. You'd have to apply to the government for the free land, but if it was granted, the whole thing's yours at no cost, and you could do whatever you wished with it, just as long as you improved it. 
With Joe's 400 acres, he would prospect for gold and create subdivisions for housing. For the next 20 years, Joe would settle into his life of prospecting, writing letters to the editor to local newspapers, oh, and occasionally restart his feud with the Greemans. <laughs> oh, man. But Joe had bigger plans. He was sick and tired of having to adhere to federal laws in Alaska, which, due to its remoteness, had become a bit of a libertarian free-for-all. Former Governor Jay Hammond stated that people had gotten very accustomed to being able to do as they pleased. They could hunt and fish whenever they wanted, like I said before, they didn't have to follow any codes, they could prospect their lands and not care about what the EPA had to say. They could just do what they wanted. As the government would become more and more interested in regulating the state like the others, Joe would grow more and more angry. In 1973, Joe began his political career with an absolute flurry of actions. First, he began a petition for citizens who wished for Alaska to secede from America. Vogler would later claim that he had gained over 15,000 signatures, but the petition never went anywhere. More importantly, Joe started the Alaskan Independence Party, or AKIP, from here on out. He would stress that the petition was all about secession, but the AKIP would solely be about reviewing the legality of the original 1958 statehood vote. He would also claim that, at this time, he brought about the first meeting of the Alaskan Libertarian Party. <sighs> he, he wouldn't stick with it, but he claimed, I was there, I helped started it, and then I left. <laughs> you know, just a little papa bird flying away. Yep. Joe's biggest move at the time, though, would be entering the 1974 Alaska gubernatorial race as the AKIP's first ever candidate. Joe would choose fellow miner Wayne Pepler as his running candidate. There isn't much about Joe's first ever campaign, but perhaps spurred by his petition, he was able to wrangle 5% of the vote. More than enough for people to claim he was a spoiler for incumbent governor William Allen at Egan. In the 1978 gubernatorial election, Joe would take a back seat and run as lieutenant governor to Don Wright. Now, Don Wright's a bit of a, um, an atypical A-kipper. One thing that made him atypical is that he was actually born in Alaska. Ooh! He was born in Nenana, which I hope I'm saying right. Uh, he was three-quarters white and one-fourth, uh, Gwich'in, which is one of the First Nation peoples of Canada and Alaska. From 1970 to 1972, Wright was the president of the Alaskan Federation of Natives. Wright began running for office in 1968 as a Democrat, and up until gaining the AKIP nomination, hadn't had much luck in attaining office. With Vogler in the background, the party attained less than 2% of the vote. And to be fair, it was an incredibly odd election, featuring a Republican incumbent, Jay Hammond, and fervent write-in campaign by a fellow Republican by the name of Wally Hickel. <laughs> and Hickel came in second place. And that sort of race doesn't really leave much room for a third-party candidate. <laughs> Now, yeah, especially if that other candidate is already a write-in. Like, that's a lot of mental energy for exactly. voters. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> there's bears. <laughs> I, like, have, I haven't seen the sun, literally, <laughs> in oh my months. God. So, all right, I'm, I'm going to do a little personal talk. We'll see if this actually goes in or not. <laughs> but um, I got to go up to Alaska for the Last Frontier Theater Conference back in oh. 2010. Wonderful. Awesome experience. If you're a playwright, fucking do it. It's really great. But um, I was in one of the bars there, and I was talking to one of the dudes who lived in Valdez, and we had a nice long conversation about um, gun rights, and he won the argument because he's like, I kind of need it for the bears. <laughs> yeah, 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 I 100% I agree. Yeah. You live a very different life than me in Chicago. Yeah. Well, and then <laughs> he kind of told me a story about one time he was out in the woods and he was kind of near a prospecting camp and he saw a big ass uh, bear and so he ran and hid under a, a cat tractor and the bear was just like walking around the tractor and he was just like I got so bored I just hit his paw <laughs> I don't know why I'm giving him that accent it just sounds like something like one of my relatives would say <laughs> but yeah it's just like you yeah you can keep your gun if you're gonna like smack but a bear's hand come on yeah don't be don't be dumb nah this is a good story bam <laughs> deal with it uh, but yeah he was like that's the one time I forgot to bring my gun with me and he was fine yeah he was fine eventually <laughs> he would have been fine sooner if he could like shoot a warning shot he would have been fine sooner if he hadn't like played footsie look sometimes you got you gotta choose love over violence oh boy you gotta see what happens oh speaking of love I had a cousin who lived in um Alaska in the 90s and I think he, yeah, he was um, working on salmon boats because, they're, like, the Japanese economy was still going gangbusters, mm -hmm. and so a lot, like, there was a lot of money to be had for top-grade sushi, so he mm. was on a fishing boat for ages, but he's living in Alaska at the time and was telling me, I was like, yeah, 
cuffing season is real up there. Like, you need to find a girlfriend before the sun sets. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like the, you know, five women who live up there. So you have, it's like, yeah, all right. Well, like, yeah. This is you'll better wear than my bed. Sad. For, <laughs> you'll wear my bed for the next eight months, and then I, yeah, the minute summer hits, it's like peace, relationship done. <laughs> <laughs> so, following this step back, Vogler would return as the AKIP nominee for governor in 1982. This time around, Vogler would get to the debate stage and make one hell of an impression. Moving the capital of Alaska had been an issue since it became a state. So, one of the problems with Juneau doesn't have a huge population. And there's no way to get to it by road. Right. Yeah, you gotta fly in. Or you gotta go by ferry. Due to Avalanche's cold weather and environmental concerns, they couldn't even build a road to get there. But tradition's a hell of a thing. (laughs) Plus, Juno's population had exploded by 222% since the previous census. Holy cow. Showing that, as the city, it did have a lot of potential for growth. As the debate raged on about whether to move or keep the capital, Joe proposed a simple plan. We nuke the glaciers. That's the dumbest idea. Well, I mean, you haven't heard what it, the rest of it is. <laughs> Do I need to? I mean, it could help. <laughs> Vogler proposed that a series of nuclear explosions along the Gulf of Alaska between Juneau and the nearest highway would make it all the easier to build a road connecting the two. Plus, there's got to be a lot of gold in those mountains along the coast. Who doesn't like gold? Yeah, who doesn't like cancer either? <laughs> I mean, just ignore the fact that it would require 430 miles of nuclear explosions to connect Juno to the nearest road outside of Cordova. I'm going to throw up. <laughs> or that the nukes may cause some slight damage to the 900 people who live along the coast in towns of Gustavus and Yucatat. Or the fact that most of the coastline contained the recently declared UNESCO World Heritage Site Glacier Bay National Park and Preserve. It's in the name, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Glacier. <laughs> And so, yeah, so that's what Joe, at least outside of his community, became known for. (laughs) Mr. Nuke the Glaciers. While the return of Joe to the top of the ticket was enough for him to gain more votes, he was only able to get 1.6 of the vote. I'm noticing these numbers are going down with every year. It's not great. (laughs) But the thing is, Joe's legal background was about to save the party. (laughs) Please tell me save is in scare quotes. (laughs) Um, It should be. You see, Vogler and the AKIP had initially been refused placement on the 82 ballot. Joe sued the Lieutenant Governor of Alaska, Terry Miller, for contravening the free speech and equal protection provisions of the Alaska Constitution. In previous elections, the AKIP had been able to make it onto the primary and general election ballots due to the qualifying being a lot easier then. Third party and independent candidates were required to attain 1,000 petition signatures and they'd be placed on the ballot. But in 1980, the state would pass a law changing the 1,000 threshold to 3% of the votes cast in the previous election. This is a requirement style used by multiple states for candidates all over the country. But the problem with Alaska is people don't live close. Yeah. So it makes it a lot harder. Mm. And using the previous election as a, as a litmus, Joe Vogler and other third-party candidates would now need about 4,800 signatures. And the new law also stated that if you sign one person's petition, you can't sign any others. So when you're living in a town like Fairbanks that doesn't have a pretty high population, right. it's going to suck. If you're living in, say, Nome or Barrow or any of the other towns where you're literally like 500 people yeah. and then bears. Yeah. <laughs> bears don't sign signatures. They're very hard to convince. <laughs> so it's almost like on the first day someone's standing out with, um, with one of those race guns and you just have to get to every yeah. goddamn house. Yeah, you gotta go. You gotta you gotta tap on bear paws. You gotta <laughs> So the only other option that Joe and other third party people had if they couldn't get the nearly five thousand signatures was to join a major party, which the state defined as any party that had attained at least ten percent of the vote in the last gubernatorial election. And of course that's only the Republicans and Democrats. Mm-hmm. And all they had to do was file a declaration of candidacy and pay a hundred dollars. A mere hundred dollars? Mm-hmm. Ooh. hundred bucks and you're on the ballot, at least for the primary. Uh, so this change in law happened three months prior to the primary and five months before the general election. That's, that seems a little, cutting it a little close. A little bit. So Vogler knew that he would have zero chance in getting nearly 5,000 signatures in that time. So instead, he filed a declaration of candidacy and sent a hundred dollar check. He just, he's like, fuck it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the Alaskan Independence Party. Here's my declaration. Here's $100. Here Eat are my me. two fingers. Yes. <laughs> Guess which one? 
Lieutenant Governor Miller had no choice but to decline Vogler's application for the ballot. Joe would then file suit, alleging that Miller dis- Miller's disapproval uh, was a violation of his free speech. The state's case relied on three points. That the state wanted a ballot qualification threshold that equaled the requirements for presidential ballot access. They wanted to have a set percentage that would be fair across the state instead of a set number that would vary in fairness depending on where you lived. And the theory that if you have more candidates on a ballot, it hurts the people's brains. Look, I'm not going to disagree. I will. (laughs) I'm biased. (laughs) Look, give me all the candidates. Don't fucking care. Put them all on. The thing is, that third argument that it hurts people's brains is probably one of the most common arguments states have for disallowing third parties onto ballots. Is just this kind of general idea that, like, no, we have to make the process easy and accessible. Which is just, like, I just don't like that argument that people are too dumb to have a third <laughs> choice. <laughs> I, I will say, it's like, if, again, if Chicago can get away with every election having five pages of judges names that yeah. we have to sift through and I, and I do yeah <laughs> oh yeah I always look to the ABA to see who they recommend yep. and who they don't because if they don't recommend someone they have exceedingly fucked up yeah and there's oh there's always one or two names where it's just like oh yeah, yeah that that motherfucker's just been riding through on yeah the fact that my brain hurts yeah from the five pages yes. of judge names 100 percent yes <laughs> So when the case went to trial, the state admitted that the ballot confusion had never actually occurred in the past, and it, there was really no evidence that there would ever that there was ever a problem in any other state. Oh my god, that. just like voter fraud. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the court would find that the three percent litmus was reasonable, but that it had been enacted too close to the primary to be fair for third party candidates. So true. They would uphold the new ballot access rules, but would strike down the requirement that signatories of the petitions had to swear to vote for that particular candidate. That's a little awkward. Yeah. Uh, The court also ordered that Vogler would be placed on the 1982 ballot under the Alaskan Independence Party banner. Just kind of like a consolation. As previously noted, Vogler didn't get that many votes, but his court case would make it easier for Alaska to remain a state more friendly to third parties and independent candidates than many others. But little did Joe know that on the heels of his greatest legal victory, an even greater enemy was on the horizon. An organization that would change the life of he and his fellow prospectors, and that is the goddamn National Park Service. Ah, yes! Fucking love those bastards. Ah, sexy rangers. Oh my god, this... They're like the CTA of federal government. (laughs) Only they care too much and will let a buffalo kill you. Despite the park system being around since the days of Teddy Roosevelt, Alaska had only one location given national park status up until 1980. That being Denali, the Mm. big old mountain. Gorgeous. That would all change very suddenly on December 2nd, 1980, when Jimmy Carter signed into law the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act. The law granted special federal protection for 157 million acres of Alaskan nature. Uh. 27% of that land would create seven brand new national parks. The new bill also recognized all native land claims that had been pending prior to 1971 and promised that if private land was surrounded by the new parks, then quote-unquote adequate and feasible access must be granted to the landowners. This took the form of using pre-existing trail roads, but only allowing heavy heavy equipment on them during the winter. So a big problem is if you have like a huge tractor or a backhoe and you're driving it over tundra, if it's melting, that shit's just going to sink right into the ground and fuck up the soil. So when you have a huge snowstorm, you can drive a cat machine right over that, and it's going to be perfectly fine. Also, cat machines are going to come up a lot. It's essentially like a, a big old tractor with a shovel on front and tracked wheels. Right. It's not the cat bus from my neighbor Toto. Ah, oh, if only. Oh, that'd be great. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> Mining just got a little cuter. He's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> How do you expect me to mine gold when that fucking kiki's flying around in our fucking broom? I gotta use the roads like a normal man. <laughs> oh yeah, and so essentially the old trail roads would be roads that people used for like ATVs or roads that, mm-hmm. you know, you couldn't put a car on it and expect to go through, but you could probably, if you had bigger mud tires and stuff like that, you could probably use it. So yeah, so part of the problem too is also when you're driving over all that uh, tundra, when, when you start making deeper divots, you gotta like drive around the divots so you yeah. don't get stuck in it, and all that does is make the trail wider and wider and wider. Uh-huh. The majority of Alaskans fucking hated Jimmy Carter for this. Something Jimmy Carter was not accustomed to. He's just such a nice peanut farmer. He's such a kind man who got shat on 
Oh, much for trying so hard. <laughs> oh, God. Lifelong Congressman da- Don Young, who created the bridge to nowhere. Oh, I thought um, it was Ted Stevens. Or no, oh, you're saying... right, it is Ted Stevens. Oh, okay. My bad, my bad. All good. Congressman Don Young fought against the bill, but Senator Mike Gravel, who most recently ran for the Democratic nomination for president because a couple of teenagers convinced him to. <laughs> Um, Gen Z, or, yeah, Gen Z. Yeah, he was like, "I'll be a meme. Fuck it, I got nothing else to do." <laughs> Christ, he's he's a very odd old man, but also very <laughs> sweet. But he forced Carter's hand and said, "You have to sign this bill." And so Carter did. And Mike Gravel ended up losing the state Democrat Party's endorsement for this <gasps> and lost re-election. Even the Democrats were like, "No, fuck you, yeah, Judas." Exactly. Wow. Yeah, and after that, Mike Gravel settled into becoming a, a 2000s meme. And for people like Vogler, it meant they no longer could get to their mineral claims without crossing federally p- protected land. So in 1984, this would all come to a head for Joe Vogler in what uh, QUAC Fairbanks referred to as the Battle of Weber Creek. On July 14th, what scientists would often refer to as the middle of goddamn summer, Joe was driving... <laughs> Joe was driving his 40-ton D8 cat tractor uh, along the Bielenberg Trail to get, get to his gold claim. To get there, Joe would have to pass through the Yukon Charlie Rivers National Preserve, and Vogler was told he would need to get a permit to drive his heavy-ass tractor through the park. Okay. Joe refused. <laughs> ben, so shocked by that turn of events. <laughs> Here's an actual quote from Joe about oh, it. Oh, no. Why should anybody have a permit to travel? Who do they think they are? Is this what's coming to in America? It's already been predicted you'll need a permit to travel from state to state. Are they going to do that in Alaska first? How much guts have they got? You know, I am really questioning where America's intended goal is. Because everything I see is contrary to what it was. If a park service is maintaining a park for the benefit of the public, they shouldn't be worrying about a couple tracks. They are the evidence of man's time here, of his activities here. Oh my god, Joe. What even is history? <laughs> Were you 1984 now? Archaeologists well, will discover these actions in the future. I need a patch on my shirt just to get to my gold land. <laughs> this is 1939. God damn it. Oh, it's, I love god. that quote so much. Just like you could, there's no way you could read that to make it sound good. Shut up. Like my neighbors needed a permit to park on the street in Rogers Park. Yeah. Joe, shut the fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> Vogler would state in the uh, KUAC produced documentary, The Battle of Weber Creek, that the trail was a public highway, which is a weird way to describe an old unpaved mining trail. <laughs> Much of Vogler's complaint was that the Park Service was ruining everybody's ability to do whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted. <laughs> And his complaints of the America he knew going away was some real hilarious bullshit since he hadn't (laughs) wanted to be a part of America for a little over a decade. (laughs) So with the kind of stubborn pride that only comes from a baby boomer that really hates the word no and views it as a a violation of his First Amendment rights, (laughs) Joe went ahead and drove into the National Park with his heavy-ass tractor. About eight miles from the exit of the park, the titular Weber Creek, the National Park Rangers would helicopter in and stop Joe from going any further. The Rangers placed a temporary restraining order on Vogler's equipment, and Joe was forced to leave his tractor and one of his large trucks in the middle of the woods until the case was settled. It also didn't help that while Vogler's mine was outside of the new National Park, he had been making plans to mine in the National Park, (laughs) and fuck you for trying to stop him! (laughs) Of course he was! Now, Joe's major legal standing was an Alaskan law that stated even backcountry trails could be counted as highways. Granted, that law had been repealed in 1976, but all Joe would really need to do is pay a fine and get a permit to get his equipment to the mine, but fuck you, compromises for normal people, and the pine cone in Joe's ass doesn't know the meaning of compromise. <laughs> oh, just... I just... Th- similarly to, to our first episode talking about all of these third-party candidates and just their intense belief in themselves it's like yeah. the the intense inability to just think past the next five minutes mm-hmm. like the like there's there's peter pan syndrome and then there's just straight up toddlerhood <laughs> <laughs> and it defies a lot like it makes my brain hurt try, trying to not rationalize but just put myself it's like I am, I'm trying to, like, where are you coming from? Oh, you're coming from, like, I can't, I can't make sense. No, no, my brain hurts because I can think past the next five minutes. <laughs> like, 
Like Joe, Joe would sit down for the marshmallow test, eat the marshmallow, punch the scientist, <laughs> and then go grab more marshmallows. To be fair, that scientist was a park ranger. <laughs> Joe would go on to also claim that the federal government didn't have the right to create national parks, nor could they stop people from claiming and mining them. He also claimed that the Park Service was violating the Fifth Amendment by claiming the trail as their property, and that they were also in violation of Articles 73 and 74 of the UN Charter, which only pertains to non-self-governing territories, not full-on states. <sighs> That ship has passed. Initially, the courts found in favor of the Park Service, but Joe appealed. Four years later, U.S. v. Vogler would be decided by the Ninth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals. Based on the court's decision, Vogler was about as bad as a witness as he could have possibly been for himself. <laughs> he admitted that to successfully drive his tractor in the summer, he had to drive off trail because it quote-unquote raised cane with the quality of the road. He admitted to cutting down trees and vegetation in the park to create makeshift bridges for his vehicles, which is something you can't do in national parks. Uh, one expert testified that some of the damage Joe caused would take up to 100 years for it to naturally return to normal. <sighs> the Ninth Circuit found all of Joe's defenses to be just bad and found for the government and the permanent injunction was placed on Vogler's equipment and his use of the parks without permit. But as in the roller coaster that is Joe's life, it wasn't all failure and shameless embarrassment. In fact, the 1986 Alaskan gubernatorial race was shaping into a perfect storm of chaos amongst all three major Alaskan parties. Ooh, the Democrats, it. the Libertarians, and the Republicans. The Democrats had one of the more straightforward and traditional bits of instability. Going into the 86 campaign, the party had the advantage of having an incumbent candidate, Bill Sheffield. However, Sheffield had done all kinds of shit to become severely disliked by all parties. <laughs> On the simpler end, he fought and succeeded in changing Alaska's time zones, shrinking them down from four to just two, uh, one of which covered the whole state, with the exception of the westernmost Aleutian Islands. It was a pretty senseless hill to die on. <laughs> especially since it was something literally no one wanted in the first place. Like they were fine with the four time zones. Yeah. Yeah, okay. But he's like, no, two, make it simple. Streamline it. <laughs> Sheffield's biggest fuck up, though, involved a government lease of $9.1 million awarded in a non-competitive bidding process Oof. that just so happened to enrich one of the governor's friends and donors. Hmm, how about that? The competition for this lease was so limited because the qualifications to win were so uh, so specific that only one person could have possibly won it. <laughs> Your name must be Dave. <laughs> you must know my favorite color. We must have hugged. As details of this lease emerged, a grand jury recommended that Sheffield be impeached. Ultimately, the House would admit Sheffield did some shady shit, but it wasn't strong enough to support a full-on impeachment. While he got to keep his job, it wasn't enough for Sheffield to keep the support of his own party. Sheffield would be crushed in the party primary by former state representative Steve Cowper. As for the Libertarians, it was a more depressing fall. It usually is. Yeah. <laughs> so in the 1982 election, they'd run their first ever gubernatorial candidate. Aww. And state representative Dick Randolph was the guy they chose. Dick is noteworthy as being the first ever Libertarian Party candidate to win elected office and is the reason that Alaska doesn't have a state income or sales tax. Oh my god. Randolph outperformed like crazy and got 15% of the vote and established the Libertarians as a major Alaskan political party for the next election. Now, for some reason, Randolph was disinterested in running again, so the party got together and endorsed Ed Hock, a person that I cannot find anything about. Oh no, that's... He is a, he's a Libertarian ghost. <laughs> Clearly no one in Alaska had either, and the Libertarian primary, Hawk was upset by Mary Jane O'Brannon. The thing that made this upset so embarrassing was that the previous election, Dick Randolph had earned 29,000 votes. The Libertarian primary mustered 371. Oh, damn. O'Brannon had won 179 to 162. The thing that made this extra shitty for Libertarians is that O'Brannon had moved away from Alaska the previous spring. The oh. <laughs> she had also been sued by the Anchorage Telephone Utility for making her own bootleg yellow pages and selling advertisements for it. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I don't know how you do that. <laughs> O'Brannon ignored the court order, uh, was found guilty, and was ordered to pay a fine Jesus of 50 grand. Christ. <laughs> That's so dumb. It's such a dumb reason to have to pay $50,000. <laughs> to uh, an entity you probably don't believe in. Yeah. <laughs> 
philosophically. Yeah, let the public market decide who's the best yellow pages. <laughs> Mary Jane has a list. She knows 80 people. <laughs> K. Prell, the spokesman for the Libertarian Party, told the Associated Press, O'Brannon may be in Texas or California. We're trying to find her. When they finally got a hold of Mary Jane, the party asked her to step aside and let Hawk be the candidate. And she refused. <laughs> Well, she's on the run. <laughs> yeah. The party reacted by not endorsing O'Brannon and ran Cock as a write-in candidate, uh, splitting the vote for the sophomore run of the party. Oh, Christ. <laughs> as for the Alaska GOP, they also fell into a crazy bit of upheaval. But for that, we have to talk about a really awesome lady by the name of Arliss Sterluski. Arliss was born in 1927 in Blaine, Washington. After double majoring in business and economics at the University of Washington, she would move to Anchorage, Alaska. In time, she would become the director of Denali Drilling Incorporated and the First Northern Bank. She would serve on many local city boards, and in 1979, she was elected to the Alaska State Senate as a Republican and held her seat there until 1993. So Arliss was more of a centrist than her fellow Republicans, which a lot of them found fairly unforgivable. But despite that, Arliss was really well liked by the public, and in 1986, she ran for and won the Republican nomination for governor. But you see, Arliss was unique in a lot of her beliefs. She was a moderate on development and protecting the environment, mm. which, in the wake of the sudden national parks, put her at odds with a lot of the people in the party. Oof. But her biggest issue was that she was pro-choice, and she wasn't afraid to say it. Yeah. Arliss's main competitor in the primary was far more conservative, and had initially been the second governor of Alaska from 1966 to 1969. Oh, wow. It was a dude by the name of Wally Hickel. It had been a neck and neck race with five other Republicans, but by 2,000 votes, Arliss would become the first ever female nominee for governor of Alaska. <gasps> Yay! And then there was Joe, once again running for governor. But this time, <gasps> AKIP would be the only party without a hint of inner turmoil. Joe chose Alaskan state trooper Al Rowe as his running mate, and Rowe would end up being Vogler's best ever running mate. He had a fondness for comparing himself to a fellow by the name of Buford Pusser. Terrible name. Awful name. But he was a 20-something cop from Tennessee who in the 70s had uh, single-handedly taken on the Dixie Mafia, which was like the drug-running, booze-running group of ne'er-do-wells in the area. He became a, just essentially like an American legend. The movie Walking Tall was based on him. Huh. And eventually he died. He was, um, if I remember right, he was assassinated at the oh, age of like wow. 28 or 29. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so Roe would take out a series of ads depicting himself as Buford Pusser, and they became really popular throughout <laughs> the state. So if the AKIP had continued losing votes in this election, I really doubt there would be much more to say after this year. But Vogler and Roe took advantage of the troubles of all the other parties and posted their best showing to date with 5.5% of the vote. Good enough for a third place finish. Cowper would defeat Strugolewski by 8,000 votes, and the Libertarians would meteorically drop from 15% of the vote to about 0.58%. <laughs> Not only had the AKIP surpassed their direct third-party competitors, but they had done well enough for the state of Alaska to consider them a major political party. <gasps> oh, shit! Which brings us to 1990. Despite the AKIP having upward momentum, four races ended up being the maximum that Vogler was willing to run. Following the 86 election, he would retire from running for office and place his focus on preparing the party for 1990. If the meteoric fall of the Libertarian Party was any sign, if the AKIP was to keep progressing, they would have to nominate a known candidate to avoid any and all infighting within the party. Former state representative, former chancellor for the University of Alaska Anchorage, and freshly former Republican John Howard Lindauer would end up winning the party's primary and seemed to be a pretty fitting replacement for Vogler, if not better. Lindauer uh, had a PhD from Oklahoma State, had worked as an economics professor, and held boatloads more political government experience than Vogler ever did. He was about the most qualified candidate the AKIP could hope, hope for. Meanwhile, the Democrats had settled back to normal, and in somewhat, a somewhat close primary, nominated former mayor of Anchorage, Tony Knowles, over Lieutenant Governor Stephen McAlpine. Uh, the Democrats moved on with no ill will and solid party unity. The same couldn't be said for the Republicans, <laughs> The moderate versus conservative rift was still palpable and grew even more so when the final primary field was filed. The same couldn't be said for the Republicans. The moderate versus conservative rift was still pretty bad, and when the final primary field had been filed, it looked like things were about to get worse. This included moderate businessman Jim Campbell, more conservative state senator Bill Halford, former AKIP governor nominee Don Wright, and our old friend Arla Sturgalewski. Now, John Wright did not have much of an effect at all in the primary. He's just more to say, fun to say that he was there. 
But the other three had trisected the remaining vote, and much to the furious chagrin of the conservatives, Arliss won again. Arliss! Now, ignoring the fact that the moderates got 67% of the GOP vote in the primary, the conservative wing was livid to lose once again to a pro-choice woman. <laughs> In 1968, the more conservative folks of the GOP who chose not to vote for the AKIP had backed a write-in candidacy of former runner-up Wally Hickel. It was believed that this led to the Democratic win that year, and the conservatives had to have a better plan than the uphill climb of a write-in candidacy. So now that the AKIP was a state-recognized party, they now had the appeal of a guaranteed ballot access. Plus, not counting all the secession bits, the party ideology was pretty closely aligned with more of the conservative people in the GOP. Oh, no. Vogler began talks with the disgruntled members of the Alaska GOP, and not a peep was leaked until everything was ready to go. The day of candidacy filing, Arliss was given a hit of amazing news. John Howard Lindauer was dropping out of the race for the AKIP. This was about as good as things could have been for her. The Libertarians hadn't even mounted a candidate. The Dems were running a pretty by-the-books candidate. The Greens were running for their first ever governor race in Alaska ever. And there was also some party I can't find any information about running called the political party. Fairly redundant, but let's... Okay. Yeah, but it was essentially nothing but liberals running. So Aww. Sturgalewski had a wide open path to the governor's mansion. Get it, Sturgalewski. For about five hours. Oh, no! Literal minutes before the filing deadline, the AKIP announced their newest candidate, former Governor Wally Hickel. Ah! If that wasn't a hard enough slap in the face for Arliss, she got a ferocious backhand when she found out state Senator Jack Coghill, her own running mate for lieutenant governor, was now running for lieutenant governor with Hickel. Judas! So while John Howard Lindauer had a pretty impressive resume, it just didn't compare to Wally Hickel. Hickel was born in 1919 in Kansas. And Wally... this is 1990? 1919. Would... No, 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 but, cur- but currently 1990, yeah. So he was 61, 71? Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, while he grew up on a tenant farm in the middle of the Dust Bowl, wow. in the 1940s he would move to Alaska, just like uh, our good friend Joe, and began a career in real estate. Seven years later, he started his own construction company. Pickle had initially been a Democrat, and by the time of the vote for Alaskan statehood rolled around, he was all for it. Sometime between Alaskan statehood and 1966, Wally switched to being a Republican, and six, in 66 he would win the party nomination for governor and defeat the incumbent governor, Bill Egan, by a thousand votes. Hickel, however, wouldn't finish his first term. In 1968, President Nixon offered Wally Hickel Secretary of the Interior. Ah! So despite strong opposition from the Sierra Club and environmentally-minded Democratic senators, Hickel was approved. <laughs> The big fear amongst those folks was that Hickel would do anything and everything for the oil industry. Instead, Hickel chose to kick the ass of the oil industry. <gasps> Hickel! He enforced tougher regulations on offshore drilling and fought for stronger safeguards on Alaska's burgeoning oil industry. After two years, Wally would find himself out of a job. The Kent State shooting had just happened, and Wally wasn't a huge fan of the Vietnam War to begin with. And so when the shooting happened, Hickel felt he had to write a letter to Nixon demanding that Nixon place respect to the opinions of these dissident students. Hickel stated, I believe this administration finds itself today embracing a philosophy which appears to lack appropriate concern for the attitude of a great mass of Americans, our young people. The thing, though, is the letter was leaked to the press before Nixon could even read it. Ooh. And he probably wouldn't have liked it to begin with anyway. Big no, yeah. And so that night, he did an interview with 60 Minutes, and 60 Minutes asked if Hickel would resign. Hickel replied by saying, the only way he would go away is with, quote, with an arrow in my heart, not a bullet in my back. Nixon obliged and fired him. (laughs) And then wrote Hickel on his list of enemies. Oh my god. (laughs) So for the next two decades, Wally Hickel would fight to get back into Alaskan politics. In 74, he would lose the primary by 8,000 votes uh, to eventual Governor Jay Hammond. In 78, Wally would run again, uh, this time losing the governor race to Hammond by 98 votes. Now, no one likes to lose, but losing by less than 100 votes, especially in a race for the job that you gave up, for a job that you would eventually be fired from, is probably enough to kind of lose your mind a little bit. So that's the year that Wally ran his first write-in campaign. Ah, fuck all y'all. You'll know my name. Yeah. While Wally's writing campaign uh, would be described as successful, he would end up losing, but he got 26% of the vote and beat out the Democratic candidate in the process. Damn. So as stated before, Hickel ran again in 86. He lost to Arliss in the primary. So back to 1990, now that we know about Wally. Yeah. So after losing her lieutenant governor in the last second, she quickly selected primary runner-up Jim Campbell as her new running mate. 
Uh, this had been a bit of a shock due to the two exchanging multiple attacks and Campbell's sexist attitude towards Arliss during the entire campaign. But when you have no time to pick a running mate, wow. you, do what you, you do what you can. So following the party betrayal, her supporters justifiably lost their shit. A direct quote from the executive director of Republican Governors Association, uh, Michelle Davis, said, Arliss has been working for four years. For someone like Wally Hickel to do what he did in 86 and act as a spoiler, that's an act of a man with a large ego who can't stand that there are no microphones in front of him. Yes, Michelle! Hickel would spurn the spoiler tag and state that the primary push for him to run came from when White House Chief John Sununu called and forbade him from running. If you remember, Sununu's also Sununu. the guy who convinced Buddy Romer yes. to switch parties. Sununu! Yeah. Stop stirring the pot! So whether this is true or not, the election was now a battle between right-wing moderate and moderate Republicans. Pickle also wanted to make it abundantly clear that he didn't support Alaskan secession, even though now he's a part of the Alaskan Independence Party. <laughs> but the state of Alaska was more of an owner state, where the residents of Alaska were like stockholders. Sort of like the Green Bay Packers. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> Now, all of this chaos uh, should have created an easy win for Tony Knowles, the Democrat. However, furious with the years of bullshit thrown Arliss's way for being an outspoken woman, a number of female leaders in the state Democratic Party threw their support behind Strugolewski. God, this is, yeah, this is just getting into a hot mess. Yeah. To make matters worse for Tony, there really wasn't a ton of difference between him and Arliss to begin with. Yeah. They were both strong proponents of women's equality. They were both pro-choice. They were both from Anchorage. Uh, they both supported drilling for oil on the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. What? Yep. Uh. Democrat. Oh, Alaska. And leading up to the election, Arliss and Tony began focusing their attacks on each other, trying to get an inner lane for the same opinions and ideals. Arliss, you could have had Tony. You could have had him as a lieutenant governor. It would have it been an interesting move. Uh, they would run TV ads addressing each other and just completely ignored Wally Hickel and the AKIP. Until the end of October, it looked like the plan was working for Arliss. As the polls had her in the lead with 35%, Knowles with 29%, but what was a little disconcerting is that Hickel was polling at 30%. Oh, man. Hickel viewed his campaign as a populist movement designed to galvanize the old spirit of Alaska. While Arliss and Tony were busy arguing over which of the two was better at their similarities, Hickel was winning over folks who never much liked the government in the first place, and people who felt jaded by the directions of both parties. And him running as an AKIP candidate only helped him with his outsider narrative. Ugh. On the day of the election, Arliss suffered a worse defeat than she had in 86, only gaining 26% of the vote. And Tony didn't do that much better, only getting 31%. But Wally Hickel and the AKIP, they got 38.9% of the vote. And after 14 years of trying, the Alaskan Independence Party was in charge. Wow. Yeah, this is a good place to stop. Okay. Yeah. I'm loving this, by the way. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the Alaskan <laughs> Independence Party is a fucking yeah. hoot. Gadfly is a production of Added Serotonin. Our theme song is Sophomore Makeout by Silent Partner. You can find us on Twitter at GadflyPod, or you can find us on Instagram at Gadfly underscore podcast.